Um, so today uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, decentralized learning, so how to learn uh, with uh, uh, a numerous number of agents and when data is distributed, and in particular uh, the role of uh, topology in decentralized learning, which is like when you have several agents, uh, how they are connected. And uh, in particular I will be interested in uh, going beyond uh, the usual measure uh, of uh, difficulty in these graphs, which is uh, the spectral gap. So this is joint work uh, with uh, Thijs Vogels and uh, Martin. Oh, uh, it doesn't work. <laughs> okay, so um, now just a few words about the setting. Uh, so what we're doing is distributed optimization for machine learning. So in this case, we assume that we have a set of agents uh, so it might be hospitals, for instance, that would like to optimize a function. Uh, so here the function to optimize, for instance, is uh, to classify a disease. And so we assume that all the hospitals have the same goal. Like they all have the same objective, but they get different data because they get different patients. And uh, they could learn a classifier on their own, but they want to uh, collaborate in order to uh, learn the objective better and faster. And so uh, what they do is that they get uh, stochastic gradients, uh, so gradient f xi t uh, of x t, um, which correspond to their uh, local patient data. And so in a centralized communication model, like if they had access to a, a global server, uh, then they could just perform some kind of global average and emulate single machine algorithms, and it would go like this. Like first they would all uh, do a computation step, apply a gradient uh, on their own data, and then they would do a global uh, communication step. And so in this case, uh, it's just averaging with everyone. And uh, in this case, this corresponds to uh, the mini-batch uh, SGD algorithm uh, because it's just equivalent to just using a batch of size n. So that's like the uh, baseline if you have access to a central server. And what I claim in this case is that by collaborating, uh, it allows the nodes uh, to have a larger learning rate. Like the fact that uh, there are several hospitals and not just one in terms of optimization, uh, it allows them to take larger learning rates because there's less variance and so to go faster, to optimize the function faster. So in the decentralized communication model, uh, you, you don't have this central aggregation. And so um, nodes are linked by a communication graph, and they can only communicate with their neighbors in this graph. And so in this case, they take the same computation step, but for the communication step, it's a little bit different. So now instead of perfect averaging, you have some kind of imperfect averaging uh, with this uh, wij coefficient, and the matrix w, we call it the gossip matrix. And um, we don't, so xt is now different from, for all nodes, uh, because averaging is not exact. And how inexact uh, averaging is, is usually captured by this uh, spectral gap coefficient. It's just uh, the difference between the largest and second largest eigenvalue of the averaging matrix. And um, for fully connected graphs, so if you can talk to anyone, then it's just the centralized case. So uh, this coefficient is a bigger one. But uh, in other cases, for instance, uh, for the grid, uh, this coefficient scales as the size of the network, or the inverse. And for a ring graph, it's a uh, squared size of the network. And so it says that when you have bigger and bigger networks, uh, then uh, the problem is harder and harder. But it's just normal because it's just more and more difficult to average with everyone. And uh, so just in terms of rates, um, then like the existing rates, uh, they're really uh, like this uh, saying like alone we go faster but together we go further. Uh, faster is how you decrease the bias and further is how you decrease the variance. And so if we're alone, uh, then uh, we decrease the bias uh, in relation with the condition number, but it's not very important here. Uh, but we go to kind of a high variance zone. Um, but if uh, we collaborate with everyone, then we decrease the bias uh, much, uh, much slower. So in uh, kappa over lambda 2, 
Uh, and remember that lambda 2 scales as the size of the graph. So it says that uh, if you're learning with many people, basically uh, you will never be able to decrease the bias. Like averaging with more people in more and more difficult, but you go further because then the variance that you have is divided by the size of the network. And so it appears as if uh, if you don't want such a precise result, you wouldn't benefit from collaboration. And uh, this is because uh, you have to reduce the learning rates uh, to learn, uh, to be able to collaborate with the people. It's like collaborating slows you down in a way. Um, and why is that? It's because in centralized uh, GD, so all points start from XT, they all apply their own stochastic gradients, and then they do perfect averaging. So they start from the white point, they go to the great point, so each point is different, and then they go, all go back to the same points. In the decentralized setting, all the points are further apart, they all go even further apart, and then they're slightly, like there's a small contraction towards the average. But they're not at the same point anymore. And so um, you still have a lot of variance. And uh, this means that when you average the stochastic gradients, they're just not taken at the same points. And so it's much harder to uh, reduce the variance in this case. Like, if the points are too far apart, then you cannot average them as you did uh, in the centralized case. And so you have to reduce your learning rates uh, so that uh, the iterates are closer and then you can benefit for averaging. And this is why we get such rates like alone faster together further. And so in this case, it looks like collaboration is like the opposite of what it is for the centralized case. Uh, it actually leads to smaller learning rates. And, well, it, that seems kind of counterintuitive and um, we want to investigate that question in this talk. And when you actually uh, look at the performances in practice, it's not the case. Right? Collaboration is large learning rates. Uh, so here are the plots. Uh, in the y-axis is the steps that you need to take uh, to reach a certain loss threshold. And um, the x-axis is the learning rate. And so we see that as you increase the learning rate, uh, you go faster and faster. You need fewer and fewer steps to optimize. And then at some point, you just diverge. Like, this is standard behavior. And we plot this for several topologies. And we see that when you're alone, uh, the point at which uh, you become unstable and uh, you start diverging uh, is for a much smaller learning rate than when you are with more people. So, uh, for instance, ring or fully connected. And so it seems that uh, although it's not captured by theory, this like collaboration uh, enables larger learning rates still happens here. Uh, it's also the case like if you increase the size of the graph, theory predicts that it will be harder and harder, whereas here uh, we see that uh, the breakpoint happens for larger and larger learning rates. Uh, so actually, uh, it seems that uh, collaboration and large graphs do help. Uh, in practice. And so, in order to capture that, we introduce a notion which is the effective number of neighbors. Uh, and why we do that is that, okay, um, when you have infinite networks, for instance, uh, of course you cannot benefit from everyone. And the problem with the current theory was that uh, if you try to uh, talk to everyone, it's just too difficult. And so instead, we introduce this notion of locality, which is like, how many people are you able to talk to? And uh, so it has this barbaric formula, and uh, it's related to the variance of uh, random walks in your graph, but that's not really important now. The idea is that it captures a notion of locality that links to the topology of your graph. And so if you have small gamma, it's parameterized by gamma. If you have small gamma, then it's just you. Like, it's the yellow circle, and uh, the effective number of neighbors is one. But as you increase gamma, you get more and more neighbors depending on your topology. So average gamma would be like people in your vicinity, and very large gamma would be the whole graph. And uh, like you also have an averaging matrix that's related to this uh, number for a given gamma that is the matrix that actually averages over these neighborhoods of increasing sizes. And um, this is just the effective number of neighbors for a few graphs. So, for instance, uh, in the fully connected setting, then the effective number of neighbors is always the whole graph because everyone is close to you. When you have two clicks, it's funny because you 
immediately have 16 neighbors, like the people in your clique, but then you need to increase gamma quite a lot to see the people from the other clique. And then you can also uh, plot this curve for like time varying exponential or alone, but you see that always when you increase gamma, the effective number of neighbors increases to being the full graph. And now uh, I just introduce um, some uh, new notion, which is uh, like how we compute the variance. And so we just make an assumption that the stochastic gradients, they're not just stochastic gradients, they're gradients of stochastic function. Like you sample the function f xi, and uh, you take gradients of these functions f xi. And so the standard notion of variance, uh, sigma squared here, will be uh, the norm of the stochastic gradients at optimum, like the norm of the individual stochastic gradients at the global optimum. And we introduce a, a second notion, which is um, we assume that uh, all the stochastic functions, they are uh, zeta smooth. And so this means that... Uh, oh, um, <laughs> this means that... Um, all the individual gradients, uh, they're much more noisy uh, than if you were to take a step with the full function. Uh, like this data is much larger than L, which is the smoothness of your uh, global objective. And if you take the case of uh, Gaussian IID data, for instance, uh, like with uh, identity covariance, then in this case you would get zeta is equal to D and L equal to one. So like you're much better off optimizing with the global. Uh, function. And so, yeah, zeta captures the amount of noise, but far from optimum in the stochastic gradients. And so, if, with this assumption, uh, we get the following uh, convergence theorem. Uh, so, if you look at the step size, it's limited by two terms. Uh, the first term is uh, basically uh, the, like, how step size is constrained by noise. And we see that it's constrained by the smoothness of the global objective plus uh, the, smoothness, the stochastic smoothness divided by our effective number of neighbors. And then we get a second term, which is uh, from collaboration. But for a given step size, we get uh, exactly what mini-batch uh, SGD with a batch of size NW gamma would uh, lead to. So basically, in decentralized SGD, what you get is um, the same performance as mini-batch SDD with some number of uh, neighbors that is not the whole graph, but that is not just you, with like some n in between. And how big n can be is uh, basically given by this uh, formula on the right. Like you want to tune the step size uh, such that you're just at the constraints. Um, and so it's much simpler with like a graphical interpretation. Like if, so this is just the, con the formula before, but plotted. And so you see that uh, as you increase the e effective number of neighbors that you'd like to have, um, at first you increase your, so on the y-axis it's the learning rate, x-axis is the effective number of neighbors. At the beginning, uh, you see more and more people, and so you reduce your variance more and more, and so um, your learning rate uh, augments. And then at some point, it just becomes too difficult to talk with these people. Like they're too far away for, from you. You don't average with them so often. And so uh, if you want to benefit from them and reduce the variance further, uh, then you enter in the second regime uh, in which you're restricted by consensus. And uh, so you actually have to decrease again the learning rate. And so uh, here you see that this breakpoint, uh, like the behavior is the same for all topologies, is just where this breakpoint is uh, depends uh, on the on the topology, and uh, these would also hold for like infinite graphs. So we don't have this problem that when you uh, increase the size of the graph, results get worse and worse because it's purely local notion. Um, okay. Um, so, yeah, I think I'll just keep uh, the ideas of the proof. The, the only thing is that basically instead of looking at this uh, distance between xt and x star like you usually do, uh, we do things in this norm m that reflects the local average. So like we look at suboptimality in neighborhoods instead of suboptimality uh, all the way, and then the rest is just technical things. And um, 
Now, just a few words about uh, experiments. So the first graphs that I showed you were for random quadratics, uh, so arguably not like the most uh, practical model. Um, but so when we look at deep learning experiments, we do see this same behavior. So again, here uh, in the y-axis is like how many steps do you need to reach a certain error threshold? X-axis is learning rate, and we see that um, if you have more and more connected topologies, then you can increase your learning rates uh, more and more, and this will get you to lower and lower error, for instance. So like this is really just uh, the key takeaway, and it's, uh, so this is for Cypher 10, and uh, if you do it on the fashion MNIST, then you get the same behavior. It's even clearer here. Uh, like more connected topologies allow you to uh, push the learning rate further uh, before your algorithm starts to diverge. And so you do gain uh, from um, you do gain from collaboration with other people. And so this is just um, a, a slide to like. Um, go further on this parallel between mini-batch and, um, and decentralized SDD. So here, uh, the y-axis is, again, uh, like how many training steps do you need? Uh, the x-axis is uh, the effective number of neighbors that you have. And the points on the curve, the circles are some topologies, and the crosses are mini-batch SDD uh, with mini-batch of size, uh, this number of effective neighbors. And so we see that here the curves align, uh, not perfectly, but like quite well. And so it means that uh, what's happening is really just mini-batch SDD over neighborhoods uh, in your graph. Uh, on the other hand, if you were to plot it with the previous metric that uh, people standardly use, which is very worst case and which is the spectral gap, then in this case, like you have no insight that you can really I derive from the data. And um, I, I kind of hid it under the carpet that um, here uh, all nodes uh, draw sample from the same distribution. We're in a purely homogeneous setting. Um, OK, uh, so we see that here uh, when we have very homogeneous uh, targets, uh, then so the setting I described is on the left. But when you start adding heterogeneity, what happens is that basically this behavior is still verified up until a ball. Like basically, uh, you don't see um, you don't see the heterogeneity uh, unless you start being quite close to optimum. And so all our insights they still hold uh, just outside of of this ball around optimum, in which the functions start becoming. Uh, very, very different. And so you still have this assumption, like this large step size thing that help. Uh, this is usually far from optimum. When you hit the variance zone, uh, you usually want to reduce a little bit uh, your learning rate. And so these are uh, like our insights, they still hold um, up to a ball in these heterogeneous settings. Um, so to conclude, um, We've seen that communication allows for larger learning rates, both in centralized and decentralized. Like, there's no phase transition when you average perfectly or not. It's really just the same thing in the end. Uh, and we do that by drawing a connection between DSGD and uh, centralized mini-batch SGD. So we um, have provided a way to characterize the effective batch size that you have for a given network. Uh, and this effective batch size depends both on the topology and the learning rates, and uh, this behavior. So now, like the theory that we have is consistent uh, with the experimental behavior uh, where the previous was. Uh, so yes, yeah, just some open direction, like theory for non-convex. Uh, so again, our experiment suggested work for deep learning would be nice to prove it. Uh, same thing, heterogeneous setting. Uh, experiments suggest it's up to a ball. Be nice to prove it. Um, we hope it helps understanding the weakness in DSDD for heterogeneous deep learning, because like DSDD doesn't work very well in these settings. And we hope that like by drawing these comparisons, we're able to understand a little bit more what happens. And same thing about like the learning dynamics, because here we're really interested in like the local. Um, 
dynamics. And so, yeah, do like does it help actually that you're computing points that are not at the same exact same point, but uh, that are close to another? So that's a potential question. And yeah, just uh, to finish that. Uh, in decentralized learning, we go both faster and further uh, together. So, thanks. Questions for Hadrian? Okay, maybe I'll, I'll try to put a twist. Um, so, in the end, you somehow boil down the convergence of uh, this joint training to topology of the network, um, meaning that somehow your neighborhood structure is important and the gains you can get are based on this effective number of neighbors quantity as opposed to the larger graph size. Right? Um, this is actually a very important point, I think, beyond just convergence on optimization. Because if you think about it, suppose you're talking about a bunch of hospitals collaborating, and you would expect actually the, the effective neighbors to have a similar distribution in terms of their demographics, right? Uh, for instance, um, I mean, uh, the, the population in one side may have different genetic characteristics, so maybe they could have high cholesterol but no heart attacks, but uh, you can also have part where the cholesterol is a little bit low but higher high heart attacks rate. So when you try to collaborate, yeah, so your model may be confused because one model would be inconsistent with the other model. Now, thinking about what you were talking about, I mean, have you considered what happens with similar settings, distribution shifts, and generalization, because I think the optimization is one side of the problem. But yeah. the generalization under distribution shifts, if you can maybe relate the this effective neighborhood to somehow adapt it in a way under distribution shift as well. I think that would be like the ultimate thing. I mean, have you thought about this? Yeah, so like we're actually, um like so for me like the first step is like this heterogeneous setting as you say like distribution shift between nodes they they have different distributions uh, different optima as you say some region of the graph might um be might uh yeah have different objectives and like your your distribution might be biased by where you are in the graph and so uh, for this there are some work that look at like the kind of topology-induced variants, like they try to optimize uh, the topology of the graph to connect these biases. Uh, now, at the moment, we're trying to extend uh, this uh, to, to consider this notion and basically try to come up with some rationale that would say that, um, for instance, if you think that you need to uh, collaborate with 20 people to have something that's... Uh, like to have a function that's not too biased, then that's what you should have. Like uh, our result is just uh, at the moment is like basically you're uh, like mini batch SDD with this uh, thing. And so what we'd like to go is really to push this further and say that uh, it's really the, this NWA is like the diversity you have. And so if, if you pick 20 neighbors, then you have enough diversity uh, then, then you'd be good uh, regarding these shifts, uh, but otherwise you're like you're biased by your neighborhood. So it's really the kind of results we are we're proving at the moment, like the yeah, how like the your bias is is deeply related to your neighborhood and in this sense, uh, and so then you can also play with your step size to uh, be less biased and and have, like, communicate with enough people without it being the whole graph, uh, basically. Very good, very good. Other questions for Hadrian? So, Masashi, on your end, do you have any questions? If not, we can actually end uh, this first day of the session. Any questions from the Japan side? Uh, Kohei, so you are raising ah, yes. your hand. Uh, yeah, I have a ahead. question on the 
uh, yes, uh, yeah, on this page. So in, in this bound, even if t increases, uh, the distance does not converge to zero. Um, uh, yeah, so um, here uh, the distance doesn't converge to zero uh, when t increases because this is for a constant step size. Uh, but then you can tune, uh, like uh, what's usually done in SDD, oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm talking to the microphone. Uh, when uh, you, um, so what's typically done in SDD is that you decrease your uh, step size as one over t. And so here, uh, if you plug in uh, eta of order one over t, then now you will go to zero. And so that's actually uh, what I refer to, so I didn't uh, talk about it, but this double win effect of decreasing the step size is that usually when you decrease the step size, then you decrease the right term uh, just because like, it scales with the step size. But now you also win because when you decrease the step size, you also uh, increase your number of effective neighbors. And so now when you get smaller step sizes in 1 over t, for instance, you win on both sides, kind of. And you can get to uh, like eta sigma square over n, which is like the uh, standard convergence rate. for Ah, okay, I see. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>